This is Battleground PA, a Penn Live podcast discussing the issues that matter to Pennsylvanians and documenting the events in the Keystone State and beyond that could shape how you vote in the 2024 elections. Hello, hello everyone. It's so great to be here with you again. It's Joyce Davis. I'm Penn Live's outreach and opinion editor, and this is another Battleground PA. We are joined today by our trusty friend, Jeffrey Lord, who has Reagan smiling in the background, so we know what party he's representing. <laughs> <laughs> and we have John Cole, who's actually an independent journalist who's reporting, right? And John, tell us a little bit about yourself and your career so people know who you are again. We have you on frequently, but go ahead, introduce yourself. Well, once again, thanks for having me back on the program. It's always a great time. Uh, I'm a reporter with the Pennsylvania Capital Star, mainly covering Pennsylvania elections and government. Of course, there's a bevy of races in the state that are important that I am uh, focusing on, of course, from the presidential uh, level down to the local races. But uh, happy to be back on and talk about all that and more uh, today. Well, great. We're, we're so glad to have you. We usually have Regette Harris, but she can't be here with us today. But it's always good to get some fresh voices and fresh ideas in here. So let's talk with, I mean, we're still talking. We're still talking about the State of the Union address. So I'm just going to go to Jeffrey. Jeffrey, I know you didn't like it, but tell us why. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell you know, us why. <laughs> you know, Joyce, I'm tempted to do this. All right, Joyce, let's talk about the State of the Union. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, oh, oh Joe, uh, I, I don't know. They had him pretty wound up. And uh, it's the first time I've ever, and I've seen a couple of these in person. It's the first time I've ever seen a president shout. <laughs> well, you know, Brett, uh, these candidates shout a lot. I mean, when they're on the campaign trail, unfortunately, they are shouting. And yeah, you could hear that in his voice. He was straining his voice. But honestly, I mean, the yeah. overall reaction that I've heard far I and wide that is that this was a, a monumental success. Because, but see, when you, put the bar low <laughs> when you when you tell us it's going to be an old man and somebody comes out and they're ready to take on the world it, it gives it a little bit of difference. I mean John what are you hearing just in your circles sure so again I I know Regent would certainly talk about the Democrats point of view but I can at least say the day after the State of the Union address President Joe Biden's very first campaign visit was where that's true in, in, in Pennsylvania that's right that's right in Keystone State and I was there in person to cover his speech. He was in Delaware County, which is a suburb of Philadelphia, and he was there to promote his uh, 2024 re-election bid. And it's interesting because essentially a lot of the points he talked about during his State of the Union address, he spoke about once again on Friday in this Philadelphia suburb. So he really emphasized that. So if anything, we already know essentially it's going to be Biden versus Trump since Nikki Haley has since dropped out of the race. And it seems like it's yep. the general election is pretty much starting early. But it seems as though my takeaway, and I'm curious, Jeffrey, yours as well, uh, Biden's State of the Union address seemed like it was the official kickoff, really, of uh, Trump. He's been now, criticized for that, for making yes. it too political, right, Jeffrey? I, yeah, I, I would agree. I, I mean, I, I again, having seen these things and read my fair share of them and all of that, they're supposed to be about the state of the union, not about the state of a president's campaign. And uh, but, you know, in, in in fairness to Joe Biden, I, I just I just think that we live we, being alive in the 21st century with social media and all of the all of the things that go on. I think this is going to disappear from the radar screen in, you know, a few oh, yeah. you know, seconds. And oh, we'll, yeah. be on, we'll be on to the next thing. We'll be on, as I say, I'm watching over here on the side, uh, the testimony of this Robert Herr. That'll right. be in the news for a few days. And then we'll go on to something else and something else and something else. Right, but, but before we go on to something else and something else and something else, go ahead, John, you got your hand up. You want to plug in something, go ahead. If you don't mind, just and, and to Jeffrey's point, he's right at this news cycle moves so quickly. So I'm certainly not disagreeing with that. But I think the points that President Biden made during a State of the Union address, again, I think he's going to hammer those points away for the next several months. And yes. some of the takeaways I got from a speech in, Phil in the Philadelphia suburbs on Friday was that uh, the suburbs of Philadelphia is where President Biden did quite well in 2020. And one can make the case that is uh, – a demographic of voters, the suburban voters that used to vote Republican, Jeffrey, you know this, they've drifted away from the Republican Party in recent years. I don't think it wasn't just one election. It was a, a period of time it's happened. And Biden really drove home uh, 
Roe v. Wade being overturned as a campaign issue to the suburban voters. Um, and even Dr. Jill Biden, the first lady, uh, spoke uh, leading up to Joe's uh, speech on Friday, and she talked about her Philadelphia area roots, um, the first ladies from the Philadelphia suburbs as well. And she talked a lot about, again, women's reproductive rights as a campaign issue. So I think, you know, during a State of the Union, he talked about it. He even kind of took a veiled shot, I guess, at the Supreme Court. There were a couple of the justices yep. were yep. present um, during that. That seems to be a campaign issue that uh, Biden's going to talk about a lot. And just one more note about the Pennsylvania angle of this is that it's, you know, we're in mid-March right now. Uh, President Joe Biden has been in the state of Pennsylvania four times already, and all four, might I add, were in the eastern region, the southeast, one visit to Philadelphia, two in the suburbs of Philly, and one in the Lehigh Valley. I think the Biden campaign is certainly pinpointing this region. I know the whole state is important, so certainly not to minimize Western PA, Central, and everywhere in between. But it seems as though in the first few months of the campaign, the Biden campaign has really made a specific focus of the Southeast. I got a chance to talk to State Representative Jen O'Mara. She is a Democrat from Delaware County. She was present at the rally. I talked to her for a few minutes before and asked about it. She's the chair of the Southeast delegation in the state house for the Democrats. And she talked about how it's not a coincidence that Biden's spending a lot of time there because I think they – they believe that Democrats, they need to drive up really big numbers in the Southeast. That's the way they can win this. If they don't drive, if, if they can't beat Trump by double digits in most of these suburban counties, they can't win. So I think they're really trying to drum up support there. Uh, and and uh, the type of voter that, again, some of these Republicans in the, the suburbs used to vote that way. Now they've seemingly shifted away. I think they're trying to make sure they don't lose those voters in this election. Well, Jeffrey's already always pointed out to us that Trump's going to be here a lot too, and has already been here a lot. So, so what what's your thoughts on that, Jeffrey? Well, I, I I have a question. I have a question for John. Um, mm -hmm. What what kind of si audience size was there to hear Biden? So this was there was a, there was a few hundred people there. I think if I'm not mistaken, I don't want to speak out of term. I believe it was invite only though, so this wasn't like a general admission. Uh, Anyone could purchase right. tickets. Um, there was a line. It was at a middle school. In uh, Delaware County, I believe Wallingford is the name of the town. Um, there was a line outside. I mean, you had your fair share of local elected officials, labor leaders, et cetera, and those there. So there's a few hundred. But again, I just want to say that I don't think this was like open to the public necessarily. I'm pretty right. sure this was invite only. The thing, that, the thing that always impresses me, w whether I'm reading about them in the media or whether I'm going to them when he's here in Pennsylvania, when Trump is here, is there's just the, the enthusiasm boggles the mind thousands and thousands of people inside whatever the event um, where wherever the event may be but thousands more outside trying hoping some a lot of times in vain that they can get inside what that says to me is that there is serious enthusiasm for him at the at the ground level nobody's forcing these people to go much less at this time of the year stand around in cold weather waiting to get in so, I, so you I do, think, think do you that, really think that that enthusiasm, people who go to these rallies will actually go out to vote? I mean, that's the thing. Just because you show up at a rally doesn't that's mean- That's a good question, Joyce, but <laughs> but I, I I do think they will. And, and the reason is um, Joe Biden is now an incumbent with a record and a record that, uh, I mean, this is not unusual uh, for any president, but- uh, he's got a record where, you know, people are running to the gas station and paying more at the pump. And I saw that well, they're paying a lot less people... now than they were paying, though. I can tell you, I, I fill up my tank and it's a lot better now. I mean, that's the point that actually the, the economy people know isn't bad. I mean, it really isn't by all stretches of the imagination. But, John, you had your hand up. Go ahead. Just you one quick... to add something. Go ahead. Yeah, just one thing to Jeffrey, if I may, because I think, Joyce, your question was a, a good one that to those who are going to these Trump rallies. And I've covered two of them. So what I add, Trump's been in the state twice already. I was there both times. I was there. He was in Harrisburg for uh, the NRA presidential forum. Right. Very large crowd there. I was present. Jeffrey, you were there. I know you got your shout out from the president. <laughs> uh, He's a celebrity. Right. Not a celebrity. <laughs> I, mean, I was there. In That's the why room. I spent most of my time under the bed. <laughs> <laughs> and then his second visit was shortly thereafter it was in philadelphia at sneaker con where president trump unveiled the, these new line of sneakers he's selling yes, he's um, getting us some he is <laughs> <laughs> so i mean i've been there both times and to jeffrey's point certainly you do see um the enthusiasm of these trump supporters so 
I think my question to Jeffrey wouldn't necessarily be, do I think these people will vote? Because I think some of these people that are waiting in these long lines, I think they're going to vote. My larger question would be, how many of the people going to some of these Trump rallies are they've gone to them many times before, like they're his base where it's not like it's their first Trump rally. I think I've encountered at some of these Trump rallies that you have like return customers, kind of like uh, well, you're, people you're on multiple at, times. Sean, you're getting at the point that everybody's actually asking. Sure, we know there's an energized base and we know there's a really excited group of people for, for Trump, but he cannot win with just that is my understanding. He must be able to pull in your independent voters. He's got to peel off some voters and that's where I think you're going to have your difficulty. I don't know, Jeffrey, way in here. Well, one of the things that I think uh, is operative always in these campaigns is that, uh, you know, as we touched on, events happen. And uh, two events that I think are going to play a role have already happened. One was the uh, murder of uh, Layden Riley, the... Uh, young Georgia nursing student who was murdered by an illegal immigrant. And then in a similar vein, um, the, the, the father of the young Marine killed uh, in Afghanistan when Biden orchestrated that, uh, in the view of many, inept withdrawal that resulted in this, son, in this man's, the death of his son. Things like that, I think, are going to play a role. Uh, in this, uh, but that, uh, but it's a role both ways because I think I actually think he did a masterful job of turning that the the thing around with the death of the student by saying you're the Republicans aren't cooperating to get legislation passed for to 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 toughen the immigration he can do law. This. So well, he he undid he all the, for that. he yeah. he undid the Trump executive orders that were keeping the border secure. All he has to do is sit down on his desk and reverse course right now. He doesn't need anything from Republicans. Well, I don't know that that's the true. It sounds to me like there needs to be legislation passed by Congress to be able to really change those laws. And that's what's been holding. And that's, I mean, that's the retort. I mean, that really is. And you, but Jeffrey, also, you're the one who says you can't blame a president for making a decision that has to do with national security. And you don't want them person prosecuted in a court of law if they do something no, wrong. No, I don't want them. Pro I don't want them prosecuted. <laughs> but what we do is we hold them politically well, that's accountable. A good point. That's I mean, you a good and I point. are old enough to yeah. remember the very, very popular Lyndon B. Johnson in a landslide victory in 1968. No, no, you're absolutely right. That's 1968, he couldn't run for re-election because of his Vietnam policy. I mean, that's right. the way it works. Let's, let's not, let's not, I, I want to make sure we get through some of the topics that we have to get through here. We've got a lot, but I really want to talk about what's going on also with the Republican Party shakeup, Jeffrey. Any insights on that? It's He's changing the leadership. Uh, his daughter-in-law is going to be the vice chair of the party. What's going on? Is that something that's going to strengthen the party, you think? Oh, I think so. Uh, first of all, the, the, the business about uh, Lara Trump. Uh, I am old enough to remember as well that uh, there was somebody named Maureen Reagan, who was the vice chair of the Republican National Committee when dad was sitting in the Oval Office. So this has been done uh, before. And I, and I have to say, it is typical. I mean, withdraw all the personalities from this. The fact of the matter is that when someone is nominated for president, um, that person, no matter who it might be in either party, floods the, the RNC or the DNC with their people and they make that organization theirs. Mm. And then, of course, yeah. if, they if they lose, then that sort of vanishes. If they win, then effectively their campaign people are running the are national running committee. So that's yeah. just the way it works. There's nothing well, unusual here. And, and we'll see. Uh, I mean, I've, I've met Laura uh, on, on one or two occasions. She's very smart, very political, exactly the kind of person that you want in that job. And there's also somebody I haven't uh, met. And very name, loyal, uh, I would assume, too, because that's Chris, a big deal. Right? Chris La Civita, something like that, who is going to be the political director there, who's coming out of the Trump campaign and is said to be very you know, sharp uh, operative. That, that's exactly the kind of people you want doing this. Well, it's no secret that Trump has remade the Republican Party to be the Trump Party. There is no secret in that. So that's where it is. But and, this and Joyce, just just to, uh, again, emphasize there's nothing unusual about this. Uh, as a JFK addict, uh, when I was a kid and 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 I remember reading, you know, book after book after book, 
one of the things that happened that generationally was that when when John F. Kennedy surged ahead and was winning the and won the Democratic nomination, um, a lot of people in charge of the Democratic Party apparatus dated from Franklin Roosevelt's time, <laughs> and and yeah. suddenly wow. the influx of Kennedy appointees was a big deal. It meant that JFK was taking over the Democratic Party and the Roosevelt people were old folks and they had to get out. In yeah. essence, this yeah. happens all the time. So here yeah, we are. Well, I, I hear you, although it's, it certainly can seem unsettling to someone who's from the outside. My whole family, whole family's taking it. Go ahead, John. Uh, just a question for Jeffrey on that note, because like you said, I think it's, it's not the first time that um, a family member of someone who's at the top of the ticket is joining the RNC. And again, I'm sure it's not far into the DNC as well. So certainly not just the Republican versus Democrat thing. But I guess my question, my larger question would be for a while, Trump is kind of his image has been he's the outsider. Remember, I think that's the way he's been able to cultivate the following that he has. Is that really going to be the same message this year? I mean, can he really say he's the outsider when he's been now at the top of the ticket? what, the third time in a row? And now he's got his a uh, family member of his that is in the RNC. I mean, essentially, like Joyce was saying, the, the party, and like you said, it's not foreign where um, the, the top of the ticket will follow, the party will follow suit with the rest of the, the top of the ticket. But I'm curious, though, like, it, is there going to be an olive branch, I guess, the Trump people will extend to maybe the Nikki Haley voters? Because I imagine they're the type of voters where you're not going to win all of them. I certainly understand. And just like Biden's not going to win every Democratic voter. But I do wonder, I mean, to those Nikki Haley voters that are angry right now, and if I'm not mistaken, I don't think Haley's endorsed Trump yet either. I think she's kind of I said she hasn't right. endorsed, has endorsed Trump. But but go ahead, Jeffrey. Do you do you think that's going to hurt his uh, claim that he's an outsider coming in to try to clean things up when he is the establishment now, the Republican establishment? He is it, right? He is, but he is in a unique role there as sort of the outsider in, in the establishment. I don't think that's going to go away because he – as most outsiders do, they do not think like the establishment and they they cannot abide that sort of uh, in crowd. It is very much junior high school. You know, you've got the in crowd kids and the and the out crowd kids. And uh, that's sort of the way it, it well, never works. to shall meet. Right. Well, so no, look, let's I, I don't think, I don't think that'll change. Um, I hear you. I hear you. You st he's still going to be coming up fighting uh, allegedly the the swamp. And, and right? as to, as to, as to reaching out, I, I I mean I think you know knowing him, I think he will try and reach out to other people. And okay. from their perspective, I think you know they're going to have a very sensitive time on their hands because to not support the nominee. I mean I don't care whether it's Donald Trump or other means that you're for Biden by definition and well, yeah. uh and and that is not something that serious well, stay home for Biden. Yeah. right i mean this is why ron DeSantis uh, quickly endorsed him and and uh vivek uh, ramaswamy i mean they want to live to fight another day and they can't really do that if they've proven themselves to be not team players yeah. Well, we didn't get to talk about the, but but maybe we'll save that for another day, or maybe it'll just, it, you know, this. It, what is going on with this Brit lady? <laughs> I mean, with the after the speech. I mean, we didn't talk about the Republican response to that, and that's turning into almost like a cult again. I mean, not. I mean, Saturday Night Live has started spoofing. I mean, cartoons are growing up. Is that going to be another thing that kind of lives on in American history? The failed uh, response to Biden. Oh, I don't. I think this will. Don't think so. uh, no, and and I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. uh, that that particular job of responding to a president at, for a State of the Union Top. Is, yeah. is miserable. Yeah. And yeah. I have I don't remember a single person who's done this over the decades, ever succeeding at but it. This, they do it. Is, people honestly, harp about them. Yeah, you know. Yeah. But I mean, this so, I mean where where to... that will impact her is uh, if we get to the convention and Trump. Uh, finds that uh, there's a move of some sort from people to nominate her for vice president. There, I think that could make a difference to the negative for her. But well, other than that, I just, I don't... I, I'm, I'm just going to say, this one seemed to be profoundly uh, <laughs> bad. I mean, from where I, I mean, I, I just turned it off. I just couldn't listen. I had to go back because I have to talk to you guys about it. But go ahead, John, you had some comments on it. Just wanted to bring attention to one other State of the Union response that actually did take place that evening. Now, certainly not to the uh, 
same media attention that, of course, the Republican response got. But the Working Families Party is like this third party nationwide that is seemingly gaining momentum in certain big cities. In Philadelphia, there's two city council members that are Working Families Party, and there's only one Republican in Philly. So might I add, this is a third party that's gaining momentum there. The progressive wing, certainly, uh, uh, you know, they're more progressive. They had a, uh, the State of the Union response from the Working Family Party was a, a, a gentleman by the name of Nick O'Rourke, who is a Philadelphia City Council member. And he had a speech because last time the Working Family Party, they often, even though they're their own party, when it's Democrat versus Republican, they will put their get out the vote effort and other resources towards the Democrat. They did it in 2020 against Trump. They'll probably do the same in 24. But it was interesting to hear his response, and I followed it and wrote a story on it, is that the progressive – let's say if you're a progressive Democrat of, of that ilk, they made the case that they certainly don't want Trump, but they had their reservations about Biden, in particular his handling on the war – uh, the Israel and, and yeah, yeah, uh, Gaza. That, yeah, that's that, a big deal. Yeah, yes, and border policy. So I, that is something that I am kind of interested to continue to follow. Is that you know will some of those in the progressive wing of the party or those who were certainly not voting for Trump, but are they going to stay home depending on what Biden's policies are in regard to that? So that's that's just one note I wanted to bring up because I understand the Republicans are certainly not happy with Biden's address and most Democrats were thrilled with Biden's address, but there is a sect of the party in which the, the progressive wing, I would say, that um, is certainly at odds with Biden over a couple of key issues, the border yes. and that were there. And I'm kind of curious. I, I, I wasn't the, aware of the Philadelphia aspect of this, but I just in general, I think that is a real problem for him. And as I think I mentioned the last time we were together, you know, that video of uh, uh, Congresswoman uh, Alexandria uh, Ocasio-Cortez being harassed by left wing. I mean, she's pretty left. And there she was being harassed by people even further to the left about her position on Gaza and, and Palestine and all of that sort of thing. And, you know, they wouldn't leave her alone. I mean, I actually felt badly for her. Uh, but it, it sort of well, it yeah. sort of personalized the fact that this is a problem out there that is uh, across the country in the Democratic Party and how they're going to deal with it uh, remains to be seen. And just the final note is I, it's only March, so I don't know how this issue is going to play out in November. I just want to say right. right now it's something that I'm keeping an eye on and I want to see how it develops because uh, when they go into the convention, will there be protests outside? I don't know. I don't want to speculate that. But at least right now I can tell you there's certainly – a at least a segment of uh progressive voters that i'm not saying they're not going to vote for Biden, but they seemingly are you know have their questions and they don't disagree with his policies well, on that we'll you, see how you that know goes. you know the democratic convention this year is going to be in chicago and, and <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm old enough to remember 1968 remember, yes. and wow uh the the then far left of the democratic party made itself heard in the streets and uh it was a mess, an absolute disaster. Well, I will say this from where I sit and what I'm hearing and the letters I'm getting and the op-eds that I'm getting, yes, the progressives seem to be making their voices heard as a way to pressure Biden, who's in power now. But when it comes time to vote, the main galvanizing force is anti-Trump. Yeah. That seems to be, that, you know, and again, we had talked before about the issues like economy. Frankly, I think economy is taking a backseat to Roe v. Wade this, this year. I mean, from where, for, at least from what I'm hearing. And then there was just a story that said, and I was shocked to see this, that it's the number one issue for black women. Number one, Roe v. Wade. So I don't know. We're, we're, we may be looking at another dynamic in, in uh, politics. I, I will I will say, Joyce, that we live here in Pennsylvania where we once had a Democrat in the governor's mansion named Casey, uh, who who certainly made uh, Roe v. Wade, as it were, uh, the centerpiece of his uh, politics, which is to say he was seriously pro-life, so mm -hmm. much so that the Democratic National Convention denied him a speaking slot. As I recall, in 1992, I think it was. Love you for those historical references, Jeffrey. Thank you. You grew a great <laughs> John, go ahead. You wanted to add something to that. That's what makes me boring. <laughs> <laughs> Not in the least. Go ahead, John. Um, just one note about, to echo your point to a certain degree, Joyce, about Roe v. Wade seemingly playing a big role. I can at least say covering Biden's most recent address, which was just a few days ago, he really talks about Roe v. Wade, and he, he he echoed the same – I think he basically said the same line that he mentioned during the State of the Union about the – I think his – I'm paraphrasing here, but I think the electoral power of women, saying in 2022, we yeah. saw it in 2023, we saw it in 2024, we will see it again. So it seems as though Biden is certainly 
discussing Roe v. Wade as a major uh, talking point during this campaign. I, I'm, I don't think, of course, Donald Trump will be using using it the same as a talking point. Perhaps to your point about the economy, maybe that's where maybe I'm sure Joe Biden will talk about the economy. He did about it did talk about the economy a bit during a state of the union and during the campaign uh, rally he recently held in the Philadelphia suburbs. But I feel as though that Roe v. Wade will certainly be a bigger talking point for Biden, while the economy will certainly be one of Trump's major rallying points. Order. Like, yeah, I, and the, I think yeah. quarter. And yeah. you know, if you if you noticed, I don't know if you saw you guys saw this, but the other day uh on MSNBC, Jen Saki, my old sparring partner from CNN, has her own show there. And she was there with Joy Reid, and uh I forget who else was with her on the panel. Well, they were literally laughing because uh Jen had seen that uh, a survey that said that the biggest issue to voters in Virginia where she lives is the border. Hmm. And I think it was Rachel Maddow who cracked, yeah, you got to seal that border with West Virginia. You know, and <laughs> the, 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 I, I'm going to tell they, you, I, don't, I could be wrong, but I don't think that's the top issue in Pennsylvania. I really don't. I'm not, I'm just not hearing it. I'm not getting it from the people that I speak to or even in the letters. I, it just isn't here from, at least not yet. John, you, you have a difference of opinion? Go ahead. N not a difference of opinion. I was just going to add that I'm curious when we see more Pennsylvania polling come out. And again, we've seen a decent amount thus far. And again, just to stress, it's March. Well, you know how fast this news cycle moves. Well, who knows what the next issue may be. Right. Forward. But uh, at this current time, I think the border is certainly something that Republicans have talked a great deal about. So certainly yeah. that's something like to Jeffrey's point, I think Republicans have talked a lot about. I'm curious to see the upcoming polls, whether it be uh, Franklin or Marshall, Muhlenberg, whatever, some of those Pennsylvania-centric ones, I'd really be interested to see them rank the issues because I'm curious, will, again, will the border rise to be a top issue and Trump, I'd imagine, would hammer that home or so? Or if it's the economy, does Trump hammer that home? I I'm kind of curious to see where those issues fall in line uh, in Pennsylvania specifically, but again, yeah, uh, I am too. Although and, and I, I, you, I'm just doubting it. But like, before we, I, I just want to say seconds. to John that since he mentioned the Franklin and Marshall poll, as an F and M alum, believe everything you see. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. But okay, let's turn our attention these last few minutes, John. You're in, you are covering Pennsylvania issues. So let's. Talk, what do we need to know about what's developing in Pennsylvania politics with its congressional races, with uh, the treasurer's races now heating up? What tell us what we need to know before we have to go? Surely. So again, there, this is an important year in Pennsylvania beyond the top of the ticket with Trump and Biden seemingly getting ready to face off. There's a U.S. Senate race between yep. Senator Bob Casey and Dave McCormick. And by the way, that essentially seems to be locked up at this point that it's going to be those two. Even though for months, it seems as though it's been a contest between the two. There were uh, ballot challenges in the past few weeks that knocked off one Democrat and two Republicans that were also going to at least file for it. Granted, they were massive underdogs anyway. It looked like it was going to be Casey versus McCormick regardless. However, now that they're formally off the ballot, it's Casey versus McCormick. Now, so the general election is starting quite early in Pennsylvania. We are seeing Casey McCormick already tie the, uh, tie the other to the top of the ticket. So keep an eye on that. It's really interesting that Casey, as soon as uh, Haley dropped out, McCormick endorsed Trump. McCormick was waiting to do that. McCormick seemingly didn't want to get in the middle of a uh, mm. party feud. As soon as that ended, McCormick endorses Trump. How does Casey respond? He sends out fundraising emails and, you know, uh, campaign emails saying he's, you know, McCormick's funny for the MAGA agenda. So we're seeing that. And might I add, McCormick has also this whole time said Casey is just a yes man for Joe Biden. Whatever Biden wants, he does. So we're seeing both Senate candidates tie each other to the respective party's leaders. So we'll see how much daylight there is in a race like that. And, of course, there's the attorney general race, treasurers, auditor general. Multiple congressional and our tenth the, congressional district is a big deal for us in the in one our of the things area, that, you know? that that's sort of out of the blue here, and I frankly don't know what to make of it, is the problems they're having in Pittsburgh right this minute with uh, a shortage of police and all this. I mean, this has been in the news. I'll be curious to see how our statewide candidates deal with it. If 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 it's ignored, if it's dealt with. Uh, how this just sort of unfolds. But again, it's one of those out of the blue things that uh, comes out of left field. And I, I don't really know quite what to make of it. Would that be more of a, a an issue for the attorney general's race, you would think, Jeffrey? Because it, it, but it's more, it sounds more like a local race to me. I, mean, <laughs> I, would, I would think so. Yeah. But then again, you know, these issues can bleed over into races that have nothing, no responsibility whatsoever. 
Uh, I mean, I suppose tangentially, you could be asking uh, the Senate candidates about federal money for, for Pittsburgh, but uh, I, I honestly don't know. Just one note on the, the local race that maybe it would impact, and again, I don't know if it will, but the one congressional race I am keeping an eye on in uh, Western Pennsylvania is the 12th Congressional District. Mm -hmm. It is where Representative Summer Lee uh, represents. Uh, she's a first-term uh, member of Congress. She is on the progressive wing of the party. Um, she is a primary challenger from Bhavani Patel, who is a local elected official out in Western PA. Um, she's a council member there. She's, Patel's run for office a couple of times and has been unsuccessful. Um, but it looks like it's mano y mano there. And it seems as though Patel had, at this point is trying to make the case that Congresswoman Lee is more in the progressive wing of the party. And I think, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think Patel released her first ad. And I think she even discussed about uh, policing and things of that nature. So maybe if there's maybe a race that could play out. Maybe, maybe it will have some impact. Yeah, it's yeah, And I'm not saying it will, but maybe that's one race if you're talking the local level. But those are one of the right. races. That's, yeah. But beyond that, we'll see the how last, that the last thing I want to want to just touch with, because we're really out of time, is just what is going on with this McAfee, with with the Democrats trying to stop their own candidate? From, I mean, any insights into what's going on there? Why would we want to discourage a Democrat from running against a Republican for for I mean, for the state legislature? What's going on? All politics is local, as I think somebody once said. And uh, I, I don't know, but I just know but enough about your politics. Point, the point you always keep bringing up is, you know, people lack trust sometimes in the system. Yes. And it seems to just feed that distrust that if, you, if you've got somebody who wants to step up and run for office and you've got people in their own party blocking them from doing so, it, it just smells bad. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Which can make it an issue in and of itself. Uh, and and that's the kind of thing that if you're Bob Casey say something like that is an irritant, right? It 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 has nothing in theory to do with your race for re-election to the U.S. Senate, but you've got party members out there squabbling amongst themselves. Uh, it, it's not helpful. And, and just to one note on it, because again, I can't speak on the Democrat side of it. I'm sure Rajet will right. shine a light on it in the next episode. But it is quite unusual that I don't think – is there not – I don't think there's going to be a Democrat in that race now. I'm pretty no, sure – that's Mahaffey the point. Like, it looks like there was a fourth right. Republican. It's like yeah. weird. And, you know, I understand Mahaffey certainly has a decent enough relationship with Democrats. I don't want to – Yeah, he's, by, he's, he's one of the most bipartisan yeah. people from what they're saying, yeah. Right, but I mean he that's – but you would you would think, though, with the slim margins of the state house being what? Right now it's a two-seat – Majority for Democrats, it'll most likely go back to one after a special election because that seat is quite conservative. The, the The margins are so narrow. So you would think that would be one of the seats that Democrats would try to flip. But you maybe they see enough of an ally in Mahaffey. I don't know. And that certainly don't want to speculate. That's where Reject could certainly add on to that. But yeah. that is a really interesting story that I also found fascinating. And I and to Jeffrey's point, I believe quoting what uh, – is that Tip O'Neill? Uh, yeah, the, I think that's right. Yeah, the all politics is local. I mean, I think that probably is another example, even though that quote said decades ago, prior to me being alive, I think it still is relevant today, though. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, frankly, we, we believe here in being bipartisan, everybody working together, one happy family. Right, Jeffrey? <laughs> <laughs> right. So with that, I'm going to once again thank John Cole for stepping in here and helping us out. And, and John, you bring a great deal of uh, uh, knowledge and expertise with what's going on right here in Pennsylvania. So we thank you for that. And Jeffrey, keep us posted on the we're, we're looking for our sneakers, OK, as soon as we can get them. All yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> See you later, guys. Thank All you. Right. So much. See you. All bye right. Bye bye. Bye bye.